during the pre-trial hearings of Neil Hamilton's 1999 libel action against Mohammed Fayed, it was decided that Guardian reporters David Henke and John Mullin would not give evidence. But their former editor Peter Preston certainly did, and his testimony in court was made up almost entirely of direct lies. In the previous chapter, we saw how, in his June 95 witness statement in defence of Hamilton's and the lobbyist Ian Greer's libel actions against The Guardian, Preston had claimed that during their first meeting of July 1993, Fyde had accused Ian Greer of paying Hamilton and Tim Smith to ask questions, with no suggestion that Fyde had paid anyone. And we saw how, in his 99 statement, Preston then claimed that the meeting took place in June not July, and that Fyde had said that he'd paid the two MPs himself, with no suggestion that Ian Greer had paid anyone. In chapters 7 and 8, we proved that both these accounts are false. We proved that Preston had actually ordered the investigation after being prompted, not by anything Fyde had said, but rather by Labour MP Bob Cryer, who'd lambasted Greer in the Commons on June the 28th, over Greer's refusal to name three MPs to whom he'd given commissions for introducing new clients to his company. We proved that Henke Mullins' investigation of July 1993 was not into any cash-for-questions allegations by Fired, but rather Ian Greer and his commission payments to these three MPs. On Friday, November the 26th, 1999, Preston entered the witness box. Fyde's counsel, the late George Carman QC, began with questions about how contact had been established between himself and Fyde. In chapters 24 and 25, we saw how Preston had stated that Fyde had contacted him through intermediaries, offering his help with a story The Guardian had published on the funding of the Conservative Party. An account that we disproved with overwhelming evidence showing that it was actually Preston who'd contacted Fired through intermediaries seeking his help. Carmen then asked Preston about his first meeting with Fired. He said, Can I ask you to specify and give details of exactly what he told you, as you remember, about the relationship between himself and, on the one hand, Neil Hamilton and Smith? On the other. Preston responded, and Greer too, the relationship was, as I have said, that Greer had been asked to come along and had proposed the fielding of these MPs in Mr Alfayed's service, and that he had seen Hamilton and Smith alone, and that money, cash in hand, had passed hands. Carmen asked him directly, from whom to whom? Preston replied, from Mr Alfayed to the MPs. Carmen responded, when you say the MPs, one at a time or together. Preston replied, I mean we were talking about Mr Smith and then Mr Hamilton, or possibly vice versa. I should say I was not taking notes. Carmen said, I follow that. What I meant was, was he saying that two MPs came together or came one at a time? Preston replied, Oh, came separately. After an interjection from the judge, Mr Justice Morland, to stop him leading the witness, Carmen then asked Preston, When you heard about the cash being paid by Mr Al Fayed to each individual MP, was that something of interest to you as a journalist and editor? Preston replied, That was very interesting to me, but if I can say as best I can how it struck me at the time, I know there are always people in every walk of life who will do things corruptly, and as there have been corrupt journalists or corrupt doctors, there have been corrupt MPs in the past. What struck me particularly about this story was the fact that he could be organised as an organisation to go in behind Mr Al Fayed with money passing and to do it in this fashion. Carmen then asked Preston about the notes he'd taken. Preston began with a rambling account of how he'd gone to see Fayed about the Guardian story accusing Saudi Prince Bandar of funding the Conservative Party. And he then said, I made a few, nor in terms of a notebook was I making notes, but I did on occasion after meetings with Mr Al Fayed go outside and perhaps in the taxi on the way back 
or if it was raining in the sort of antechamber of Harrods by the bottom of the steps, make a few notes just to jog my memory of what was happening when I had to go back and brief reporters. At this point, we'll compare the two sets of notes that Preston disclosed in both libel actions. In the 95 action, Preston disclosed seven photocopies. One of these depicted a double page spread, while the remaining six featured single pages. Thus Preston disclosed a total of eight pages from his notebook. For the 99 action, Preston disclosed 15 photocopies, all of which depicted double page spreads, so this time Preston had disclosed a total of 30 pages from his notebook. In the first action there are just two pages of significance, one which bore details from the Ritz Hotel bill supposedly showing that Fyde had had it to hand during their first meeting, and another which states Ian Greer, Tim Smith, Neil Hamilton, questions for Al Fayed's. This entry doesn't purport to show that Fyde had made cash for questions allegations against Greer and the two MPs, but it is clearly open to being construed as such. A comparison between the two sets of notes shows that the first page from the first action becomes the fourth page in the second action. The second page becomes the eighth. The third and fourth pages become the ninth and tenth. The fifth becomes the thirtieth. The sixth becomes the twenty-seventh. The seventh becomes the twenty-sixth. And the eighth becomes the twenty-fourth all very confusing, which seems to be the idea. Of the remaining new pages, there's only one of significance, the one on the right hand side of sheet number 11. This clearly purports to show that Fyde had made utterances about cash sums given to Hamilton. Carmen then introduced Preston's notebook as evidence, and as he did so, said to Mr Justice Morland, my lord, of course the jury can see it, but with respect to Mr Preston, his writing is not the easiest, and therefore... They are personal notes taken, Mr Justice Morland responded by saying to the jury, They are difficult to read. What I will do, members of the jury, is, as Mr Preston translates his writing, write out what he says he has written. Some of the words are fairly difficult to read. Mr Justice Morland, George Carman and Hamilton's counsel, Desmond Brown QC, then all had a chat about the notes pagination and into which ring binders they should be put, after which George Carman began questioning Preston about them. He said, Mr Preston, with respect to your handwriting, can you take us all through, please, the words and figures that appear and take it slowly, page by page? Can you tell us when you are moving on from one page to another? Preston replied. Yes, I cannot be absolutely certain. As you say, even I cannot read my handwriting some of the time, and this was done as I said in taxis or on knees, and I did prepare some time ago very... Actually, when the notebook was found, I did spend a day or two going through it, puzzling through that. I've not got that in my head now. In terms of what we see here, I think the first page, page number one, are jottings for an economic leader. I do not think they're anything to do with this case. Carmen said, nothing to do with the case at all? Preston said, no, I do not think so. Accordingly, Mr Justice Morland said, I am putting a line through that page. To interject for a moment, here we see the cleverness with which Preston had crafted these notes. Notes which, the evidence proves, are utterly bogus. By making them scrappy, erratic and difficult to read, they do indeed have the appearance of having been written in snatch moments at the bottom of staircases and in taxis, just like Preston said. And, by littering them with extraneous comments that all parties agreed should be struck out, an implied genuineness is immediately conferred on those entries that all parties agreed should remain. George Carman continued by asking Preston about what was on page 2. Preston replied, 
page 2. And this, again, there is nothing sequential to this, because this occurred much later, rather than at the beginning of anything. That is a jotting of Mr Hamilton's hotel bill at the Ritz, that shows the days that he stayed there. It shows a number of rooms, and 21,004.45 francs. Carmen asked him, Does it have Mr Hamilton's name at the top? Preston replied, It is Mr Hamilton's name at the top. Carmen asked, Dates when he stayed at the hotel in the Ritz in Paris? Preston said, That is right, and the little bits of squiggle at the bottom are my poor attempts to convert French francs, at the then prevailing rate, into English pounds. All very convincing. Preston then took Carmen through page after page of various notes about early day motions, British Airways, Syrian fixers, Saudi royals, British aerospace, and other such matters, before jumping to the last page, whereupon he said, Page 15 is the outer page of the diary, and I think that is what those words, Ian Greer, Tim Smith, Neil Hamilton, questions for the fireds, Carmen interjected. Sorry, I'm a bit lost. Should we turn to page 15? Preston said, Yes, I'm sorry, that is what I'm saying. I think at this stage the diary actually moves in from... The notebook moves in from the other side. Carmen asked Preston if he could read it out. Preston said, Yes, I can. It says, Ian Greer, Tim Smith, Neil Hamilton, questions for Al Fayed's model, and then down below, which identifies it, I think, as the some jottings from the first meeting, is Rafi Saeed, which was, of course, my mishearing of Wafik Saeed, the Syrian, and Prince Sultan. Carmen asks, That is the Saudi matter? Preston replies, that is to do with the Saudis, but that, that page identifies it as, if you like, headline notes from the first meeting. A little later, Preston says, so that is the Saudi stuff, but then you see, on the left-hand side of that page, Tim Smith may be at, the mention of that, then we move into Tim, Carmen queried, back to page 13, are we? Preston replied, Yes, back to page. I am sorry, Mr. Carmen, where it says AF2. That probably is me sort of making a note for another meeting, but I think it looks as though it is blanked out. It could be about something extraneous. Then we are back on 12 to Neil Hamilton and on 11 to Neil Hamilton, £18,000. It says Hamilton. £2,000. I am sorry, that is a little... Mr Justice Morland interjected. Neil Hamilton, £18,000. Then Hamilton again, is that right? £2,000. Preston responded, that is right. Carmen asked Preston, are you able to tell the jury whether that page, which has Mr Hamilton's name with money sums on it, was a note taken at or about the time of the first meeting or later? Do you have any idea? Preston replied, It was taken at the first meeting, unless it was, as you say, a repetition of something which had been said at the first meeting, but I believe it was taken at the first meeting. So, to recap, out of a total of 30 pages from Preston's notebook, there are only three of significance. One supposedly showing that Fyde had shown him the Ritz bill. One supposedly showing that Fyde had made some accusation against Ian Greer and the two MPs. And the new page showing that Fyde had made some utterance about cash amounts given to Hamilton. However, the evidence we discussed in chapters 26 and 27 proves that Fyde didn't obtain a copy of the hotel bill himself until October the 20th, 1994, so Preston couldn't have made any notes from it in July 1993. Furthermore, the evidence we've discussed throughout this film, and are still to discuss in chapters 39 and 40, proves that following Preston's meeting with Fyde, David Henke and John Mullin merely continued with their ongoing inquiries into Ian Greer. Enquiries which most certainly did not concern any cash for questions allegations made by Fyde or anyone else.
Accordingly, Preston's entire testimony so far is shown to be pure theatre, while his notes are shown to be no more than concocted props. A little later, George Carman said to Preston, You have explained how you went there, as it were, on the Saudi story, and this matter of Mr Hamilton and Mr Smith arose. And you have explained about the way in which he described payment. Can I ask you this? On the issue of payment, how was the matter developed in any kind of detail? Preston replied, At the first meeting there were two strands of conversation, one concerning Greer and the hire of Greer, Ian Greer Associates, and the other of the payments of the two MPs who were working for Ian Greer. As I said, I was, however, far more interested in the actual activities of Ian Greer, because this was an organisation which seemed to be organising these things rather than individual freelance acts. Carmen asked him, When you say there were two strands, for the avoidance of doubt, can you please explain to the jury what you mean about the two strands of payment? Preston replied, I was talking about the hire of Ian Greer as a company to do work for Mr Alfayed and the payment of money to Mr Hamilton and Mr Smith, who were the fielded representatives of, if you like, hired people from Ian Greer Associates who were doing Mr Alfayed's business. Carmen said, In summary, how did the whole description given by Mr Alfayed strike you as a potentially important journalistic story or public story. Preston said, I was, of course, very preoccupied with the Saudi affair, which continued to preoccupy me, but it struck me the second part of the story, the story of Mr Greer, Mr Smith and Mr Hamilton, struck me as something which, in my experience as a journalist, was on a scale beyond which I had imagined these things could take place. I write a lot about American affairs, and I had written a lot about lobbying in the US Congress, and I had not realised that these sorts of things on that level could take place here. So I thought it was a very important story, and I thought it needed to be out in the open because the public should know about it. A little later, Preston then explained what had supposedly happened following the meeting. He said... I talked to Mr Paul Johnson, the news editor of The Guardian then, and said I thought that we needed to look at Ian Greer Associates in a great deal of detail. He suggested that David Henke be put on the story, David having a huge degree of expertise in this sort of area already, and a few days after that, I think John Mullen, who was a more general purpose reporter, was assigned to help Mr Henke with his inquiries. So, to summarise Preston's testimony so far, he says that Fyde had accused his lobbyist Ian Greer of fielding Smith and Hamilton, not paying them, and that Fyde had said that he'd paid the two MPs himself. But despite these admissions of bribery by Fyde, Preston says he was far more interested in Greer. But despite his greater interest in Greer, and despite his interest in lobbying, which he says he shared with his Cash for Questions co-author David Henke, neither Preston nor Henke cited the roasting that Greer received from Bob Cryer during the long-awaited debate on lobbying on June the 28th, a debate which Preston's own newspaper had trailed on June the 22nd, and which, if Preston met fired on June the 24th, as he now claimed, was held in the Commons just four days later. And despite all of the above, 15 months later, Preston then published a headline story based on Fyde's word alone, accusing not Fyde, but Greer of bribing MPs and characterising Fyde as an honourable informant. Apart from being provably false in every particular, Preston's whole account is utterly absurd. Moving on. As mentioned earlier, in chapters 26 and 27, we prove that Preston did not see Hamilton's Ritz Hotel bill any time in July 1993. But for the sake of completeness, we note that Preston later told George Carman, with respect to Hamilton's stay, It came up, I am inclined to think, at the second meeting with Mr Alfayed. That would be July the 14th. Carman suggested, the summer of 1993? 
Preston said, 1993, yes. Carmen then asked him, were you shown a copy of the bill or details of it? Here, Carmen gives Preston the option of saying that he'd seen merely details of the bill rather than the bill itself. However, Preston is quite clear that he'd seen the actual bill. He said, using passive language, note, I was shown a copy of the bill and took notes from it, and those were the details that I think we rehearsed in looking through the notebook there. A little later, Preston says, What we had was that I was shown a copy of it and allowed to take notes from it, and that was to show me that it was a real bill. Following the weekend, on Monday the 29th of November, Peter Preston was cross-examined by Neil Hamilton's counsel, Desmond Brown QC. A few minutes in, Brown asked him about the change in his account from what he'd stated in his first witness statement. He said... Mr Preston, can you explain why nowhere in the witness statement of the 26th of June 1995 is there any reference whatever to Mr Fyde telling you in June and July of 1993 that he had paid Mr Hamilton cash direct? Preston replied, At that stage, Mr Brown, we were talking about cash for questions and not precise cash routes. As I look at this statement now, it is slightly confusing, and I acknowledge that, and I wish to say very clearly that cash in hand was mentioned. That was clear in a number of conversations and documentations in June, July 1994 and beyond. Here, Preston says that he and Fired were, to use his words, talking about cash for questions and not precise cash routes. But on Friday, Preston had told George Carman, solemnly, under oath, and repeatedly with absolute clarity, that Fyatt had said that he'd paid the two MPs himself. Preston even referred to his notebook as evidence of that. Now, after being confronted with his first witness statement, in which he said that Fyatt had accused Ian Greer of paying the MPs, Preston comes out with a wholly incompatible, Utterly preposterous story that Fyatt had said that Smith and Hamilton were taking cash to table questions, but that Fyatt didn't say who was doing the paying, and that he, Preston, didn't bother to ask him either. Desmond Brown responded, It is more than slightly confusing, Mr Preston. If what you say is correct, and you are telling the truth about what was said to you by Mr Fyde in 1993, it is a highly significant omission, is it not, that this witness statement, made when your memory was fresher than it is today, contains nothing about Mr Fyde having told you that he paid Mr Hamilton cash direct? Preston replied, It is your assertion that my memory was fresher than it is today? If I was in a situation where I could explain the situation, that would be different. But I was doing this in the middle of the summer from a fairly dislocated point of view. Whatever that means. Desmond Brown probed further. Mr Preston, you were on the verge of a large and substantial libel action in June 1995, were you not? Preston responded, I was being named in it, yes. I was no longer the editor. Desmond Brown continued, You were a defendant. You were the editor. The Guardian's reputation was on the line in that action, was it not? Preston answered, That is true, yes. Desmond Brown responded, And you are saying that nevertheless, when you made your witness statement in 1995, you left out something that Mr Fyde had said to you in 1993? Preston said, no, I did not leave out anything at all deliberately. There were, as I said, two strands to the allegations that Mr Fyde was making. Cash in hand was one of them. I regret if, inadvertently, I made that less than clear. I would have happily made it clear in the trial, and I am happy to make it clear now. Brown continued, But Mr Preston, it is not a question of making it less than clear. You did not make it clear at all, did you? Preston replied, The words are as they are. Desmond Brown then said, Well, where do you say that you made it less than clear, as opposed to not making it clear at all? 
Preston said. I am saying that, in the context of the meeting with Mr Fired, it was clear to me that money was passing all over the shop, and that Mr Greer was having money, and that Mr Hamilton and Mr Smith were having money. And then Preston referred to testimony he'd given the previous Friday. Desmond Brown then said, Mr Preston, I will leave this in a moment, but can you point to any passage in this witness statement in which you say anything to suggest that Mr Fired told you in mid-1993 that he had made payments direct to Mr Hamilton as opposed to money through Ian Greer? Preston replied, Not in this witness statement, but in all other contexts, including before the witness statement. Whatever that means... In chapter 32, we saw how Preston had told Downey's inquiry that Fyde had not made any brown envelope allegation back in July 1993, at which time Henke and Mullin had conducted their investigation. Preston's slip-up exposed the bogusness of the Guardian's claims that Henke and Mullin had put a brown envelope allegation to Tim Smith and Neil Hamilton on July the 22nd, and also to the lobbyist Ian Greer the next day. As we discussed in the previous chapter, to get himself out of this fix, for the 99 action, Preston claimed that he'd had an extra meeting with Fyde on July the 21st. Citing this new meeting allowed Preston to say that Fyde hadn't made any brown envelope allegation initially, as he meant to say to Downey, but that Fyde had done so before Henke and Mullen conducted their interviews. Preston explained to George Carmen QC how he discovered that he'd had this extra meeting. He stated, I obviously spent a good deal of time trying to get the dates as straight as I can, and also to compare my diary, which was not complete because it was kept on the outside office, and sometimes I was getting calls inside the office, which I just note down on a pad. I think I had meetings at Harrods on July the 14th, July the 21st, and then on July the 27th. There is a meeting on July the 21st which is not in my diary, which is in Mr Fired's diary. Later, Desmond Brown confronted Preston with what he told Downey on February the 10th, 1997. He said, You were asked by the barrister helping Sir Gordon this question at 8.23. At the same time, the in-envelopes aspect was raised as well? Answer, no, you say. Cash in hand. We did not discuss whether it was a brown envelope, a grey envelope, a white envelope, or what. Was that part of the evidence about envelopes true or not, Mr Preston? And will you please answer that question, yes or no? However, in his reply, despite this new extra meeting of July the 21st and the explanation that it facilitated, Preston simply capitulated. He stated, The reference to cash in hand is true. I wish to say, and to explain if you wish, Mr Brown, that the reference to brown envelopes or grey envelopes or white envelopes at that stage was a failure in my memory. Brown suggested, so the evidence was not true? Preston replied, It was mistaken in only that area. I was telling exactly the facts about cash in hand. I could not remember at that stage any mention of envelopes, although, looking back in my papers, I was clearly wrong. I had a lapse of memory. Brown continued, You said in terms, we did not discuss envelopes. Preston replied, we did not discuss brown envelopes, grey envelopes or white envelopes. We did not discuss grey envelopes, white envelopes or brown envelopes. Brown probed. What is it, Mr Preston, that has brought back this matter to your recollection? Preston replied. Well, it was brought back to me immediately after the Downey hearing. In fact, when everybody said, Christmas, you have forgotten. To interject for a moment... Preston had forgotten all right, but he'd certainly not forgotten that Fyde had made any cash in brown envelope allegation. He'd actually forgotten that the Guardian's defence revolved around the clever misrepresentation of John Mullins' use of the brown envelope metaphor, as we discussed in chapter 32.
That's what Preston forgot. He continued. But going back in the papers, several things contributed to it. I should say I was at this stage not in the job I had been in, and I was having a difficult time in a difficult situation, and I had come back for the downy hearing from a holiday abroad. So I was not at my finest, and nor was I as up to date as I should have been in the reading of the paperwork. After a short interruption, Preston continued, The situation was that I then looked at the paperwork which had been prepared and sent to Sir Gordon Downey. Here, Preston is of course referring to the doctored John Mullen computer note that Alan Rusbridger had printed off his Apple Mac. Mr Justice Morland interrupted him. What do you mean by paperwork? It was not your paperwork, your own notes, was it? Preston, clearly flustered, replied. No, no, I am looking at the notes of Mr Mullen and Mr Henke and of the feasibility story that was written by Lord Downey. This is just gibberish. Preston talks of the feasibility story that was written by Lord Downey. Mr Justice Morland remarked, Looking at the paperwork would not assist your recollection if the paperwork was not your own paperwork. Preston then says, I was looking at the paperwork that had been submitted to the Guardian by Lord Downey's inquiry. At which point Desmond Brown then asks, Mr Preston, all that we are concerned with is your recollection at that stage on the 10th of February 1997 of what you and Mr Fired had discussed in the summer of 1993. Preston responded, Yes, and in that context, brown envelopes were not... It did not seem to me were something that stuck in my head particularly. If cash is passing in hand, it is usually in an envelope. What was concerning me was that cash was passing, and the activities of the surrounding political lobbying which was causing that to happen. After several more exchanges, Desmond Brown finally said, You see... What I am saying, Mr Preston, is you told Sir Gordon Downey in the clearest possible terms that in 1993 Mr Fired had not told you anything about brown envelopes. Having no other option open to him, in his response Preston condemned as false his one statement that the evidence proves was actually true. He said, Yes, and I was wrong. Desmond Brown then asked him, what do you say that he did tell you? Preston said, He told me that cash was passing in hand. Looking back, Brown said, Just pausing there, is that all he said? That cash was passing in hand? After Preston parried the question, Desmond Brown asked him again, Did Mr Fyde say any more, according to you, than that Mr Hamilton had received cash in hand? Preston responded, Apart from a mention of the Ritz, moving on to the production of the bill that I now believe was at the second meeting with him on July the 14th, there was a general rant. Yes, there was a general rant. He was talking about the greed of politicians. Brown tried to pin Preston down. Never mind about what you call Mr Fired stock speeches and general rants. Am I right that in 1993 he told you about the Ritz bill? and he told you that Mr Hamilton had received cash in hand? Preston responded using absurd, passive language, as always. He said Mr Smith and Mr Hamilton were taking money, cash in hand. That is what I... There are several more exchanges between the two, after which Desmond Brown said, You see, nowhere, Mr Preston though I have given you the opportunity to tell the jury all the detail that you can recall, have you told them that Mr Fired said to you in 1993 that the cash had been paid over in brown, white or grey envelopes? He did not say that, did he? At this point, Preston finally seeks refuge in the explanation which depended upon the new meeting of July the 21st. He said it had been paid over in envelopes, yes. Would you let me explain, Mr Brown, rather than hectoring this context? Cash had to be paid over in some form anyway, 
you do not hand over large bundles of cash. It seemed to me obvious that they were in envelopes, and I think at the meeting on July the 21st, which I referred to on Friday, just before Mr Henke and Mr Mullen went to see Mr Smith and Mr Hamilton and then Mr Greer, that I must have come back and mentioned that to them. And if you say how do I know that, because I do not remember clearly, to be truthful, I do not remember clearly, the question of envelopes did not seem to me particularly germane at that point. It was obvious that if money was being passed over, it was being passed in envelopes. Brown suggested... I see, Mr Preston. So it was not anything that Mr Fyred said, it was your deduction, is that right? Preston obfuscated. No, no, I am trying to give you the best of my recollection, but could you please understand, Mr Brown, that the question of envelopes at that stage was not large in my mind. It was the question of cash passing over. Brown responded. So you are saying Mr Fyred told you that he had passed over, in your words, cash in hand? Preston said, that is true. Later, Preston returned to the explanation that depended upon the new meeting of July the 21st. He said, I was told that cash was passing. I am as clear as I can be in my mind, without giving an artificial clarity, that at the meeting of July the 21st we discussed envelopes. It did not register with me very strongly, but, in the context of what Mr Henke and Mr Mullen then went on to ask, I think it is very clear that that did come from me. Later, Brown asked for a firm answer to a simple question. To the best of your recollection, as you sit in the witness box today, did either you or Mr Fyde mention Brown envelopes, and if so, which? Preston replied... I was going back from the meeting on July the 21st to talk to Mr Henke and Mr Mullin. It is clear to me that I must have mentioned brown envelopes to them. I was the only person who could have done so. That must have come from Mr Fired. But I have to say I have no clear recollection of that, nor did it seem to me at the time germane. Here, Preston says that he must have mentioned the colour of the envelopes, as Henke and Mullen could only have got it from him. But this is simply not compatible with what John Mullen says in his statement, discussed in chapter 35. John Mullen states, At the beginning of July 1993, Peter Preston asked me to begin investigating Mohammed al Fayed's allegations. I recall that even at this early stage, the specific allegation which had been made was that Mohammed Al Fayed had paid the two MPs direct and the money had been given in brown paper envelopes. Without even referring to any documentary evidence, we can safely say that the only rational explanation for the disparity between Preston's account and Mullins is that both of them are false. A little later, Desmond Brown raised the issue of Preston's notes. He said, On Friday, you said that when the notebook was found, you spent, and I quote your words, a day or two going through it. The pages that are now produced to the jury are more extensive, are they not, than were disclosed to Mr Hamilton in the Guardian action. Preston said, I have no idea, to be honest. A little later, Desmond Brown then said, you produced eight pages in the Guardian action. You produced 15 now. Obviously, we are concerned that there may be other pages here which are relevant to Mr Hamilton. Preston said, As far as I am concerned, Mr Brown, you and I have worked together. If you want to, for your own personal satisfaction, look at anything, you are quite welcome. Brown then referred to stickers that littered his notebook, covering up supposedly genuine notes about other issues. He said, Can we remove the yellow stickers? Preston said, In one or two areas, in terms of the Saudi story, because there is an interview there with the Saudi source to whom you have referred, and I am anxious about that, because I think if that were to be out in the open, he would be at risk. But as far as the rest is concerned, I think it is purely a question of relevance or irrelevance. There has never been any secret about this. All very convincing stuff. At this point, Mr Justice Morland suggested a mid-morning break. 
George Carman suggested that during the break, Preston could cover up the passage mentioning the confidential Saudi source, and the judge then offered Preston a stapler for the purpose and said, What I suggest is that the jury and I rise now, and if you, Mr Preston, would like to remain in court, and should we say 11.35? Preston said, Would it be helpful, my lord, for my solicitors, within a couple of days of finding this, and time was very short, I did spend a long time at my computer at home going through it and doing the best translation I can. That translation is somewhere in my bag here, if I could get that out just to help me. Mr Justice Morland agreed. After the break, Desmond Brown said to Preston, Mr Preston, this notebook, which way round did you start it? Preston answered, Every which way, actually, but I think it began with the page which says page one. Ian Greer, Tim Smith, Neil Hamilton, questions for Al Fayeds, Wafik Saeed and Sultan. Brown said, That is 15, so in other words it was back to front, was it? Preston said, That is correct, yes. Brown said, You are sure about that, are you? Preston said, I cannot be sure of anything in this context because the pages are not numbered and it can be quite confusing. But I spent, as I said, a difficult time when I found a notebook going through it very carefully and transcribing it and that seems to me overwhelmingly the likely way it is to be read. After several exchanges about various issues, Desmond Brown then said, The next page, 11, is again a note taken after the first meeting, is it? Now again, that was originally half covered up. Can you tell the jury what was written on the first half of the page? Preston said, Go to Tehran, I think, and then something which is completely incomprehensible even to me. Then it says, Neil Hamilton, 18,000, crossed out, and then Hamilton, 2,000. Brown said, This page was not disclosed in the Guardian action. Can you explain why it was that even though you had spent a day or two going through your notebook, you did not disclose this page. Preston replied, I can indeed. Now that you tell me what you are talking about, Mr Brown. What happened? I found the notebook. I called my solicitors at Allswang's immediately because time was pressing and it was important. I think Nicky Schroeder from Allswang's came up to my office and we went through the notebook, sticking yellow stickers over things that she thought were irrelevant. The case, as you know, never happened. What I deduce was that the sticker on that particular page must have come loose. It was nothing to do with me, and indeed, when I was providing the transcription of what the diary actually said to the best of my ability to Oldswangs, no more than two or three days later, I absolutely included that page and what was on it. So it was nothing to do with me. I had no reason to do anything but put the diary in, as my solicitors instructed, and I gave them the information that they needed. Brown said, The sticker did not come off or come loose. It was presumably actually placed over this page. Preston said, You would have to ask Miss Schroeder. I was going through the diary with her and doing my best to translate every page. I gave it to her. She took it away and then I provided a complete transcription of every page for Allswang's for their cross-checking. Brown said, Allswang's transcript, as we can see, if you look at the transcripts enclosed with their letter, which you have, did not include this page, did it? Well, it did not. Preston replied, No, it did not. Mr Justice Morland then asked Brown, Do you think this particular detail is worth pursuing? Brown replied, I am not going to pursue it, no my lord. As we've seen, throughout his time in the witness box, Preston used obfuscation and vague passive language and he cited failures of recollection to explain away the absurd anomalies in his evidence. Indeed, as we mentioned in chapter 16, such was his dire performance, following the trial Preston wrote an article which sought to make light of it. This opens up. There's nothing like five weeks in court, as I spent with the Hamiltons, for making you feel utterly puny. Up in the witness box or down with the groundlings, the litany seems the same. I can't remember. I have no memory of that. I have no such recollection. I definitely have no such recollection. 
What's happened 5 or 10 or 15 years ago? The fogs of forgetfulness fall constantly over witnesses on every side. You get the idea. However, there's evidence proving that there's nothing wrong with Preston's memory at all. 18 months earlier, in May 1998, the Daily Telegraph published an article by Lord Pearson defending the former Conservative Minister Jonathan Aitken, whom the Guardian and Fired had also brought down. Peter Preston took issue with this article and fired off a letter the same day, setting out in precise detail a chronology of eight events that had taken place during 1993. Preston ended his letter thus. Since every one of these matters has long been in writing and possessed both by Mr Aitken and friends of Mr Aitken as well as the relevant authorities and since they do indeed shed an entirely different light on Lord Pearson's account I am perplexed to see them emerge in such misleading confusion. These eight events, about which Preston was keen to demonstrate his accurate recollection, took place at around the same time as the far more significant events in the Hamilton case, about which Preston has had to revise his account time and time again as his lies have been exposed. There's even better evidence. We recall in chapter 22 our discussion of Preston's draft article on Fired's motivation, exposing the falsity of Preston's claim that Fired had not been motivated by his blocked passport. Fired's former director of security, Bob Loftus, had given this to me, along with a draft of Henke and Preston's Cash for Questions article. He told me that Preston had faxed both of them to Harrods for Fired's attention the day before the Cash for Questions article came out. When I was writing my book Trial by Conspiracy in 1998, I was tempted to discuss this draft article and its implications. But I was also mindful that Hamilton had issued a new writ for libel, and I was curious as to how Preston would react when confronted with it in the witness box. Accordingly, I kept it to myself, and a few days before the trial began in November 1999, I gave it to Hamilton's leading counsel, Desmond Brown QC. Then, in the closing stages of his cross-examination, Desmond Brown shoved it under Preston's nose and said, Could I just show you a document? George Carman interjected, Whose document is this? Brown replied, Mr Preston's. Brown then handed a copy to the judge, turned to Preston and said, Mr Preston, those are your words in manuscripts at the top, are they not? Preston replied, can I just have two seconds to find out what this is, please, Mr Brown? Brown said, Would you like me to suggest to you what it is? Preston must surely have thought that this document would never see the light of day. He recognised it in an instant and responded, Please suggest it. It looks like a draft article. Brown said, By you? Though Preston had set eyes on it for only a few seconds, he was emphatic. Yes, absolutely. Brown said, Can I suggest what it is? What I suggest it is, is the draft for an article that was published on Friday the 21st of October, the day after the article which Mr Hamilton and Mr Greer sued on. Once again, despite the precise detail of Brown's question, Preston again expressed no doubts. Yes, he said. Brown continued, and it is your writing at the top, Article 2 for Friday, in draft. Did you not send the draft to Mr Fired? Preston said, That looks, if that is where you got it from, yes, I did. But Brown didn't say where he'd got it from. If Preston hadn't withheld it illegally, it could well have been among the scores of documents that the Guardian disclosed in the first action. But... In an instant, Preston correctly deduced that Brown must have got it from Harrods. By so doing, Preston betrayed that he remembered faxing it to Fired in October 1994, and he also betrayed his awareness that he'd withheld it. Preston's two actions from five years earlier, which he remembered in an instant, were not insignificant, but they're nevertheless utterly piffling when compared to the cash for questions corruption allegations that he now claims Fired had made in June 1993 
but which he, Preston, didn't mention only two years later in his June 95 witness statement. A witness statement for which he had those two years to remember what Fired had supposedly alleged. So much for the provable falseness of Preston's accounts being due to his unreliable memory. Coming next in chapters 39 and 40, an assembly of stark, irrefutable evidence condemning the entire Cash for Questions fiasco for what it is. The world's biggest and, quite literally, most subversive media scandal of all time. 